You have heard its ideas and listened to its music. You have viewed its artwork and watched its superstars. You have read its literature and bought its products. You may even have participated in its therapy and shared in its rituals. You perhaps have embraced some of its philosophies all without knowing them as the New Age. We have all seen their symbols, the rainbow, the pyramid, the triangle, the eye in the triangle, the unicorn, the yin-yang, which is two black and white comma shapes nestled together in a circle, goat heads on pentagrams, even 666 worked into some art figures. While these symbols do not necessarily indicate the New Age movement, they are often associated with it. You have probably heard some of the leaders' names in discussion, names like Alice Bailey, Benjamin Crean, David Spangler, Levi Dowling, Fritjof Capra, Abraham Maslow, Marilyn Ferguson, and most of all, Shirley MacLaine. You may run into the New Age mentality in your life at your local health food store or at the exercise class at your fitness center. You may run into it in motivational seminars or even in religious classes held in some churches, yes, even here in San Diego. You will certainly see it on television and it has invaded the major hit movies of our land. The scope and the influence of the New Age movement is worldwide and it is truly awesome. The more I have studied this, the more I have realized that we have been unprepared and unarmed because we have not understood the subtle uh, nuances and influence of the New Age movement in our day. I suppose no one lays it out as well as Marilyn Ferguson, who has been given credit for writing the New Age Bible, The Aquarian Conspiracy. In her book, she says that the Aquarian conspirators New Age people range across all levels of income and education. They are school teachers and office workers, famous scientists, government officials, lawmakers, artists, millionaires, taxi drivers, celebrities, leaders in medicine, education, and psychology. You will find them, she said, in corporations, in universities and hospitals, on the faculties of public schools, in factories and doctor's offices, in state and federal agencies, on city councils, and on the White House staff. You will see them in state legislatures, in virtually all arenas of policy making in the country. They have invaded every place where power is brokered, and they have coalesced into small groups in every town and every institution. The term New Age is actually an outgrowth of an idea that started in the study of astrology. Astrologers, as some of you may know, believe that evolution goes through cycles that correspond with the signs of the zodiac. Each of these cycles supposedly lasts from 2,000 to 4,000 years. New Age advocates say that we are moving from the cycle associated with Pisces into the one associated with Aquarius. The Aquarian Age is believed by New Agers to be characterized by a heightened degree of cosmic consciousness. That is why when Marilyn Ferguson wrote her best-selling New Age Bible, she called it the Aquarian Conspiracy. She chose the word Aquarian even though she said she wasn't into astrology all that much. She said, I was drawn to the symbolic power of the pervasive dream in our culture that after a dark, violent age, the Piscean Age, we are entering a millennium of love and light. In the words of the popular song, the age of Aquarius, the time of mind's true liberation. Now, the book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, is sort of a compendium of New Age social agenda and philosophical vision. And it was given the status as the unofficial scripture of the New Age movement. So if Marilyn Ferguson wrote the New Age Bible, then uh, Shirley MacLaine has become its high priestess. And some of you remember back in 1987 her five-hour miniseries on television titled Out on a Limb. 
It was promoted. In fact, I have in my file the Time magazine that came out uh, the week before the series was on television with a huge picture of Shirley MacLaine on the front and all of her craziness on the inside. Shirley MacLaine played herself in the miniseries, and she told the whole world that she had been selected to reveal the New Age philosophy to a skeptical age. It's interesting to read about her life. She had at one time been an atheist, but she grew up in a Baptist Sunday school and went to church early and attended Sunday schools just like the one we have here. She went to church in Virginia with her brother who was an actor, Warren Beatty. She now believes that the Bible is metaphysical, full of descriptions of UFOs, angels emerging from spaceships, and channeling with spirit voices. She's come a long way from her Baptist Sunday School days. According to Shirley MacLaine, her moment of naked truth came in a hot sulfur pool in the Andes where she felt her conscious self drift from her body and soar high into the Peruvian sky. Her soul flowed out of her body, though the two were connected by a thin silver cord. She claimed to have risen so high that she could see the Earth's curvature and McLean revealed in a later book that when it came time for the publication of her book and the production of the miniseries, she got help from Alfred Hitchcock, who was channeled to her from the grave. And I don't want to make fun of the woman, but people actually follow her and think that she's something that we should respect in our day and age. Now, some of you have heard the New Age movement is here, but you just wonder, is it really that much of an issue? Where did it come from, and why are we taking so much time to deal with it? Well, I wish I had time to go back into the 60s and 70s and lay the foundation of a counterculture that most of us remember. I don't know when the first time I remember seeing this, but probably you can think back into your lifetime, remembering the first time you went into an airport and saw a Hare Krishna in there uh, giving out flowers or chanting, and it sort of struck us as rather funny that they would be doing that. What are they doing that here? Then all of a sudden it became so commonplace that we didn't think anything of it, and we saw them everywhere, and it was no big deal. We just kind of stared straight ahead and moved on. But that was sort of a signal that something strange and new was happening in our culture. The Eastern religions were beginning to make inroads into American life. We now know that 4% of the United States population is Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu. There are 4 million followers of Islam in the United States and about a quarter of a million black Muslims. That means that now there are more Muslims than there are Episcopalians in America. The total number of Buddhists in North America is between 3 and 5 million, according to the American Buddhist Congress in Los Angeles. Buddhist chaplains are now recognized in the United States Armed Forces. A 1978 Gallup poll indicated that 10 million Americans were engaged in some aspect of Eastern mysticism and 9 million in spiritual healing. Now these numbers from the East may seem unrelated to our subject until we realize that this Eastern religion, which has come into our culture, has been repackaged and it is now being presented in our Western culture deceptively wrapped. As someone has said, this religion is a religion that allows us to keep our BMWs and the designer tennis outfits, but it allows us to achieve enlightenment anyway. It is a new age of Aquarius that accepts MasterCard and Dolby stereos. It is the lies of Eden appearing to us in friendly faces all over again. So if you want to know the inroads that the new age has made in our culture, listen carefully. 34 million Americans are concerned with inner growth, including mysticism. 50% of all Americans believe that they have been in contact with someone who has died. 14% of the American people endorsed the work of spirit mediums, or what New Agers call trans-channelers. Between 1978 and 1984, belief in astrology rose from 40% to 59% among school children. In 1978, Northern Illinois University conducted a survey which indicated that two-thirds of American adults read astrology reports and 36% of American adults believe that the reports are scientific. In May of 1988, the media was filled with reports based on a book by the former White House Chief of Staff, Donald Reagan. The book 
said that President and Mrs. Reagan frequently read astrology forecasts and that Nancy Reagan consulted with astrologers to help schedule her husband's activities and travel. Researchers estimate that New Agers represent 10% of the population of the United States at the present time. Northern Illinois Survey also reported that more than half of the American people believe that extraterrestrial beings have visited the Earth, another common belief of the New Agers. Some are saying, and perhaps accurately, that the New Age movement is the fastest growing belief system in our country today. And its influence must not be misunderstood or underestimated. New Agers are the opinion makers in our world. Nesbitt, in his book, uh, Megatrends 2000, has a very awesome statement. He said, 95% of the readers of the New Age Journal, which is their magazine, are college-educated with a household income of $47,500 annually. New Agers represent the most affluent, well-educated, successful segment of the baby boom in our culture today. Our businesses are being infiltrated by what they do. For instance, major corporations have hired New Age consultants to help increase employee productivity. The syllabus of Stanford University, Graduate School of Business, their course in Creativity and Business taught by Michael Ray, lists in its syllabus meditation, chanting, and dream work. Yoga, Zen, tarot cards are also part of the class. Procter & Gamble, TRW, Ford, Polaroid, AT&T, IBM, General Motors are only a few of the dozen companies that now either have hired gurus or are teaching seminars based on New Age thought. According to Fortune magazine, the aim of these gurus is to alter people or corporations radically by unleashing energies that purportedly remain unused in most of us. And they seek to liberate the mind by breaking chains of habit and passivity and change our whole way of thinking to the New Age way of thinking. Publishing a New Age is a major, major business. The New Age Journal had a circulation of 50,000 in 1983. In 1989, it's 165,000. The first National New Age Yellow Pages was just published and there were more than 450 listings in it. B. Dalton, Walden, Doubleday, Brentano's, Crown, and other major stores and distributors are helping get out the New Age message. And if you don't believe this, when you go into your secular bookstore the next time, look for the New Age section. Don't stay long. Just look for it. And notice how big it is and how extensive are the offerings on the shelves. Between 1985 and 1989, the number of New Age bookstores, that is, stores that are specifically for the purpose of disseminating New Age information, doubled, and there are now 4,000 of them in the United States. According to the New Age Publishing and Retailing Alliance, it is continuing to grow at a rapid rate. The total sales of New Age titles now exceeds $100 million a year. New Age records sell $500 million a year. Audio and videotapes for mind expansion sell $300 million a year, and it grows year after year. There are all kinds of products that are associated with the New Age movement, and they're all hits. Crystals, pyramids, statutes, incense, greeting cards, charms, pendants, talismans, fortune-telling devices, astrology charts, computer software programs, herbal medicines, esoteric vitamins, rebirthing tanks, Many other such products are being sold in record numbers as the movement gains momentum in our culture. Now, some of you may wonder, what is the basis of all of this? And this is where I want you to listen carefully, put on your thinking cap, and let's try to stay together. Maybe the best way I can introduce it is to tell you that when the American atheists held their national convention in Denver in 1987, Madeleine Murray O'Hare said, there is no God. Soon after, Shirley MacLaine toured Denver, and she told her listeners that she and everyone else were God. Then Billy Graham came to town and declared at a crusade that Jesus Christ was the only God. So there you have it, three views of who is God. And maybe it's good that we have the statement concerning these three people, because it will help us 
to recognize that what you think about God depends upon your worldview, your assumptions about ultimate reality. When you boil it all down, there are basically just three worldviews that are possible. Madeleine Murray O'Hare, Shirley MacLaine, and Billy Graham are the most well-known representatives of these particular worldviews. Let's look at them one at a time. First of all, Madeleine Murray O'Hare and atheism. Atheism is a word which is made up of two words, the letter A, which negates the meaning of the second word, which stands for God. Atheist means ah, no, theos, God, no God. Madeleine Murray O'Hare believes that there is no God. If there is no God, according to her philosophy, there is no spiritual dimension to the world. There are no souls, there are no angels, there are no demons, no mystical realities. Atheism denies the possibility of life after death. Carl Sagan, one of the leading writers of the atheist group, has eloquently expressed this worldview in his book called Cosmos, where he wrote, The cosmos is all there ever was, all there ever is, all there ever will be. In other words, what is here and now that we can see, touch, taste, and feel, that's all there is. There is no God. There is nothing beyond it. Well, Madeline Murray O'Hare is an atheist. Billy Graham represents theism. That simply stands theos for God. Theism is the belief that God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He is personal. He is all-powerful. He exists outside of the universe. He is made known to us through his written revelation and through his own son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He alone is to be worshipped by man. That is the doctrine of theism, and that's what we believe. Well, you go from atheism to theism, and finally you come to Shirley MacLaine, and what she believes is pantheism. Now, pantheism is another word made up of two words. Pan, which means all, and theos, or theism, which means God. What Shirley MacLaine believes is ancient Hinduism. It is the idea that God is all and all as God. And we'll explore that because that's what we're studying. Pantheism is best understood when we understand that it teaches that God is all and conversely that all is God. A pantheist believes that the final reality in the universe is spiritual. To a New Age pantheist, matter or what you can see and touch and feel, it's all just an illusion. So like the Hindus, they teach that we must deny the existence of the material world so that we can escape into the world of the mind and spirit. Following this logic, New Agers create a God that is impersonal. If you've read any of their literature, or even if you watch Star Wars, you know that the New Age God is recognized as a force. God is energy. Energy is God. One of the leading spokesmen of the New Age movement is a physicist. His name is Fritjof Capra. He has a book called The Tao of Physics, and he explains how the 20th century quantum theory and relativity theory force us to see the world like a Buddha sees it. His idea is that if all is God and God is all, that there is no such thing as uh, reality, that we are all just a reflection in some way of the energy which is a part of the world. And he has taken a very exacting science and just taken it totally apart from the exactness of it, and he's created a a relative mind-boggling adjustment even for the scientists who study in his discipline. The New Agers believe that God is just an it. One New Ager put it this way, In the beginning there existed the great energy, the gestalt. We call it God, but any other name would serve just as well. New Agers believe that everything is connected, that everything is interconnected. This is known as monism, and it means that there are no distinctions. In other words, things which appear opposite are not really opposite, they're really connected. New Agers describe the superconsciousness which gets into all of this as principle, and you will hear these terms, mind and power and unity and especially energy. They love the word energy. As you go through their doctrine, as you understand their philosophy, you realize that they have taken some major steps. Now watch carefully. They believe that all is one and that all is God. And they assert, therefore, that if all is one and all is God, that man is God. 
New Agers believe that you are God and that I am God. And that all we have to do is to raise the level of our consciousness. All we have to do is get into cosmic consciousness and we will begin to realize the divinity that is in us. It is almost beyond belief to hear the blasphemous expressions of New Age leaders when it comes to the divinity of man. Here are just a few representative statements so that you will understand I know what I'm saying. A New Age philosopher by the name of L. L. White said, and I quote, It has long been held that whoever denies the transcendent God asserts his own divinity. In dropping God, man recovers himself. It is time that God be put in his place, that is, in man, and no nonsense about it. End of quote. Theodore Rozak, another New Ager, said, Our goal is to awaken to the God who sleeps at the root of the human being. Stuart Brand says, We are gods, and we might as well get good at it. Now you think that one through for a moment. A Maharashi, who was the father of Transcendental Meditation, said, listen to this, Be still and know that you are God. Terry Cole Whitaker, bless her soul, she said, You are God, I am God, together we are God, and together with our own consciousness, awakening and choice, we create the kingdom of God, worship yourself, you are the light. Erhard Warner, who was the founder of EST, wrote these words. He said, As you can see, this universe is perfect. Don't lie about it. You're God in your universe. You caused it. You pretended not to cause it so you could play in it. End of quote. These people are intellectual giants of the greatest magnitude. You know what scares me most at all? I've quoted some of the New Agers, but what scares me more than anything else as I read their literature is that this pantheistic language has crept into the church and it is now being found in some of the statements that leading word of faith or positive confession charismatics are actually making on television and in their writings. I have described them very carefully as word of faith and positive confession charismatics because not all charismatics buy into this. In fact, many of the ones that I know who are personal friends of mine abhor that this doctrine is even being associated with their name. Listen to what they say about being, quote-unquote, little gods. If you have watched television, if you watch some of their programs, you've heard it. Earl Polk wrote these words, Adam and Eve were placed in the world as the seed and expression of God. Just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens, so God has little gods. Until we comprehend that we are little gods and we begin to act like little gods, we cannot manifest the kingdom of God. End of quote. Casey Treat is the pastor of Seattle's Christian Faith Center, and he tells us in his tape series, Believing in Yourselves, to come to the point where we feel comfortable claiming our Godhead. Now I want you to listen to this, which has been transcribed from the tape. Here is Casey Treat talking to his people in a live setting. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost had a conference, and they said, Let us make man an exact duplicate of us. Oh, I don't know about you, but that does turn my crank. An exact duplicate of God. Say it out loud. I'm an exact duplicate of God. The audience repeats it a bit tentatively and uncertainly. Come on, say it. He leads them in unison. I'm an exact duplicate of God. The congregation is getting into it louder and bolder with more enthusiasm each time. Say it like you mean it. He's yelling now. I'm an exact duplicate of God. Yell it out loud. Shout it. And they follow him as he leads. I'm an exact duplicate of God. I'm an exact duplicate of God. And then he said on the tape, when God looks in the mirror, he sees me. When I look in the mirror, I see God. Oh, hallelujah. End of quote. When you hear things like this, you understand Norman Geisler's comment when he says that the New Age movement is the most dangerous enemy Christianity faces in the world today. It is more dangerous, he said, than secular humanism because we have taken a few scriptures that talk about us being in the image of God 
and we have taken them to a level far beyond anything that the Bible ever warrants. And whenever you say that man is God and that God is man, you have made a major step beyond the boundaries of the Scripture. Yes, if you say man is God and all is God and the world is God and the animals are God, the cows are God, and the ants are God, and the trees and the weeds and the stones are God. Everything is God. But let me tell you, to say that man is God is hardly a compliment if the same can be said for worms and thistles. I think it would be good for me just to stop for a moment and, and insert this. We have the time to do it. India is the country where Hinduism is the religion. And New Age theology is nothing more than Hinduism remade. It is just our brand of Hinduism as it is being exported here in this country. So if India is a country where these ideas have been consistently applied, pantheism or Hinduism should result in a higher concept of man and elevated human dignity. But look at India today. Has it happened? Let's ask that question and try to answer it. It has not happened for the same obvious reasons that it will not happen in this country. For in saying that everything is God, man loses his uniqueness. He has been reduced to the same level as the plants and the animals around him. Shirley MacLaine said that she got into Eastern religions because she found conditions in India so depressing. Starvation, poverty, death, difficult for her to accept. So she was tempted to construct an independent reality in mind that looks at starving and all the rest of that and says, well, it looks like it's there, but it's not really there. It's kind of a, a pseudo-Christian science that it's there, but it's not really there. It doesn't exist in the reality of the mind. But I would like to ask Shirley MacLaine and others who talk about famine in India, what has caused the shortages in India? And if you've done any study in that regard, you know that it is not because the country is poor in natural resources. Indeed, it is one of the richest countries in the world. The greatest source of the problem in India is pantheism or Hinduism, the conception of God that is being promoted in the United States by the New Age movement. For instance, in India, you are not allowed to kill rats because those rodents are, of course, God. The July 1977 issue of the National Geographic magazine estimated that 20% of India's food supply is being consumed by rats. This was enough grain, said the survey, to fill a freight train that would extend from Los Angeles to New York City. Monkeys destroy an estimated 15% of India's food and another 15% is fed to non-productive cows. These animals in India are more important than starving infants. And why not? For if God is everything, then everything should get equal treatment. Rats cannot be exterminated, cattle cannot be killed for food, trees cannot be cut down to serve the needs of man. Pantheism puts animals and man in inanimate items all on the same level and says, we are all God. So what difference does it make? The advocates of the animal rights movement often teach that animals should be given the same rights as humans. On Christmas morning, members of the Animal Liberation Front stole 11 German shepherds and a collie being used in heart research at Harbor UCLA Medical Center near Los Angeles. After the break-in, a phone call was received asking, why don't you save the dogs and do research on yourselves or welfare recipients? Whenever we give the same rights to animals as we do to humans, man is brought down to the level of the animal kingdom. Whenever there is a conflict of rights, as there must be, man must be willing to defer to the animals. What right does one god have to trample on the rights of another god? The cows can be fed and the babies can starve. If you think that these ideas have little respect in the United States, let me with tongue in cheek ask you to consider this article from the March 1986 Farm Journal entitled, Where Dairy Cows Find Nirvana. A cow named Dworka and several of her kind in uh, Uniata County, Pennsylvania, are pampered and talked to just like members of the family. These cows need not fear that they will be led to the slaughterhouse 
When their milking days are over, they are free to retire, lounge around the barn, and swap bull stories. The article humorously describes how Americans can, for a donation of $3,000, adopt a cow for life. As a reward, the commune will send the donor an 8x10 color photograph of the cow, a gold certificate, and sweets made from the cow's milk. Of course, there will be periodic reports of the cow's progress, and a get-acquainted vacation weekend at the farm comes with the price of the ticket." End of quote. Now, I know I'm being a little facetious here, but I want to tell you something. Pantheism, Hinduism, just wipes out all the distinctions between God and man, and God is a pickle or a plant or a person or a pole, and it totally destroys the dignity of man and the deity of God. Now, is this really a new age truth, or is it really just an old age lie? And I think if you've listened carefully so far, you might be surprised to discover how old this lie really is. And I want to look at it and just, I want to show you some scriptures and I want to look at it in three ways. First of all, I want you to see the old lie initiated in the heart of Lucifer. And then I want you to see the old lie introduced into the human family. And finally, I want you to see the old lie incorporated into the world system. Do you have your Bibles? All right, let's look at some passages together. First of all, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. In the 14th chapter of Isaiah, we have the record, beginning at verse 12, of the fall of Satan from heaven. Where did the old lie begin? It was initiated in the heart of Lucifer himself. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground who didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend about the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Where does all start? It was initiated in the heart of Lucifer, which was the sin that caused him to be excommunicated from heaven. If you want more information about this, you might look up Ezekiel chapter 28 and read it sometime. I want you to look with me secondly at the old lie introduced to the human family. When did the old lie of Satan that was initiated in his heart get introduced to the human family? Well, take your Bibles and turn back to Genesis chapter 3. While you're finding your place there, one of the very common terms in uh, New Age terminology is the Lucis Trust. L-U-C-I-S, Lucis Trust. The Lucis Trust used to be the Lucifer Publishing Company. They changed it because they got so much static over the name, and the Lucis Trust publishes all of Alice Bailey's books, one of the leading spokeswomen for the New Age movement, and it really is the Lucifer Publishing Company. Now let's read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, the New Age old age lie being introduced to the human family. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. For God doth know, said Satan, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Now I've written down four things under that verse, and you can just write them down in your notes, because here's what Satan talked to Eve about when he introduced this old lie into her heart. Number one, he told her about the deity of man. You 
will be as God. One of the great planks in New Age theology is the deity of man. We are gods. Secondly, he told her about the death of death. You shall not surely die. What do New Agers teach? That nobody dies. You just keep reincarnating yourself to higher levels of, uh, of life, hopefully. Nobody ever dies. The New Age doctrine of reincarnation is their answer to the Christian doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The third thing, relativism, which is a part of New Age theology. You will know good and evil. Satan said to Eve, if you do what I ask you to do, you will be enlightened. You will get the higher cosmic consciousness. And now you will be able to say what is right and what is wrong. And you know what the New Agers teach about right and wrong? That there is no difference. That right is as good as wrong. That it's all blended into one great, wonderful one. And fourthly, spiritual powers. Your eyes will be open. Satan told Eve what New Agers are telling us today. That we can be as God. That we will never die. That we will be able to determine good and evil and set the standards for our own morality. And that we will have a higher level of consciousness through an enlightenment of our eyes being opened. So that's the New Age lie or the Old Age lie being introduced into the human family. Now, we've seen it initiated in the heart of Satan in his fall, introduced to the human family in Genesis 3. Let me take it one more step. The old lie was incorporated into the world system. This New Age theology that we're talking about is nothing more than the system of the world. And when was it incorporated? It was incorporated at the Tower of Babel. Listen carefully. When you read the Old Testament, you can't help but notice how many times the name Babylon appears. The city of Babylon began when men rebelled against God and attempted to build a tower to heaven called Babel. You remember that? We're not going to look at that particular passage because I want us to see another one, but if you're writing it in your notes, it's Genesis 11:7, where they said together, Come, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And this is the beginning of cosmic humanism, or the New Age theology. From this beginning at the Tower of Babel, if you know the Old Testament, Babylon became a world power, with its sorcery permeating the ancient world. What was it the Babylonians believed that was so wicked? I want you to turn with me to one other passage, and that's in the book of Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 8. Here we have a statement concerning Isaiah, a prophecy against it. It is one of the most amazing things in light of what is happening in our culture today that you will ever read in the Bible. I want to read it with you, beginning at the 8th verse. Isaiah 47, verse 8. This is about Babylon. Therefore, hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. For thou hast trusted in thine wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be that thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee, with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander every one to his quarter. None shall save thee. Now, I want to take this apart for just a moment, and I want you to listen carefully. 
Number one, the Babylonian doctrine that was at the core of their wickedness was the deity of man. Twice in this text, they are said to be saying, I am, and there is none beside me. I am God. I am God. That's what the Babylonians believed. They believed that they had achieved a level of deity equal with God. They also believed in the death of death. Whether it was reincarnation or not, we do not know, but they believed that they were beyond death. Notice what it says in the text. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of my children. I shall never die. They also believed in great spiritual powers and enlightenment. I've gone through the text in my Bible and underlined these words, but let me just read them to you. Sorceries, enchantments, wisdom and knowledge, multitude of self-counsels, astrologers, stargazers, monthly prognosticators. All of those are terms that belong to the shamanism of the New Age movement. One writer, researcher that I read in my studies told this story. He said, I once attended a day of lectures at a New Age retreat center near Baltimore, Maryland. One speaker summed his points up by explaining what was meant by the coming New Age, and then he enthusiastically concluded with a statement that should chill Bible-believing Christians. He said, and it all started in Babylon, folks. End of quote. He was right. It is nothing more than the world system. And I thought about this this week. Do you know who the two most important kings of the Bible are? In the Old Testament, pagan kings, I mean, it was Nebuchadnezzar. In the New Testament, it was King Herod. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar proclaimed himself as a god and said, Look at this great kingdom that I have built. You remember what happened to him? He found out that he was related to the animal kingdom, didn't he? In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 12, Herod proclaimed himself a god, and he was eaten of worms, and he died. The two most important pagan kings, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, representing the world system, both had deeply involved in what we would call today the New Age system, the New Age philosophy. So we see in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, the end of all of this, and we haven't time to look at it, but if you want to find out what happens to Babylonian thought, go to Revelation 17, and you will find out that in the end, when it is full-blown, when the world system is full-blown as a world economy and a world religion, and it is a world government, that it will ultimately be destroyed in the program of God. Shirley MacLaine has summarized in her book what she believes, and it is exactly the old lie of Lucifer, the Garden of Eden, and Babylon. She believes the following. You are God, although you may be ignorant of it. You have lived before, and you will live again. There is no death. Perhaps the belief in death, she said, is the greatest unreality of all. And there are as many realities as there are people, since we create our own reality. End of quote. If you go through the doctrines of the New Age movement, you will find over and over again that they rest upon one basic practice. And I want to share this practice with you, and then we're going to finish. The concept of the New Age consciousness is built on their deep commitment to the fact that we have to change the way people think that the paradigm of thinking in our culture is all wrong. We can no longer continue thinking conceptually. We have got to move away from the logical, conceptual way that we think and into the right brain which thinks in pictures and images, and we need to raise our thinking process to a higher level of consciousness. That's the whole terminology wrapped around their doctrine. They believe that if they can get us to come to a place where we divorce our, our mind, literally divorce our mind from the way we function, that we can then come to nirvana. We can then come to the highest level of consciousness. Do you see what a master stroke that is of the enemy? Satan could never build a kingdom of oneness for the Antichrist without dealing with the issue of doctrine. But if you get people to think other than conceptually and logically, you can get them to forget about what they know as gnosis, and they will simply know what they feel, what they understand through the higher consciousness of their process. One of their writers 
has uh, put it uh, very, very succinctly. He is a, a guru. His name is Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. You haven't been to that one? Here's what he said. Listen carefully. He said, it is not that the intellect sometimes misunderstands, rather the intellect always misunderstands. It is not that the intellect sometimes errs, it is that the intellect is the error. It always errs. You see what he's saying? Don't think logically. Don't think conceptually. Don't think by precepts. Don't study truth that is written down in Revelation. Get away from that and get up to a higher level of consciousness where you can then achieve all that you should know in the higher consciousness of who you are as God. And the way that they achieve that is through mind-altering techniques away from their intellect, away from their ability to think. But I thought in closing I might share one of the common ways that it is done, and this has been around for some time. It is now being retooled so that it can be up to date with the modern New Age movement. It is uh, what we know as the EST movement, E-S-T, populated by Warner Earhart of the Earhart Seminars training. Now it is known as the Forum let me tell you what happens in their mind-altering seminars. This is an exact report. Several hundred people are brought together for two successive weekends of marathon sessions designed to help them to get it. During the sessions, they are confined to their chairs for long hours without note-taking, talking, smoking, clock-watching, or sitting next to anyone they know. Minimal food and bathroom breaks are strictly observed. Each of the 16-hour sessions is led by a trainer who berates, taunts, and humiliates the crowd by insisting that their lives don't work. The sustained intensity leads them to become sick, to cry, to break down, or in some other way lose control. And that is the goal. Through the agonizing hours of torture, the tears turn to insight and the sickness into enlightenment. The participants are told, you're part of every atom in the world, and every atom in the world is part of you. We are all gods who created our own worlds. And when you finally get it, you have arisen to the higher consciousness that makes it possible for you to understand who you really are. You are a god. 325,000 Americans attended those seminars across the country including celebrities such as Yoko Ono, Carly Simon, Diana Ross, and John Denver, and I could go on through a list of many more. And that's where we are. One day in the year 850 B.C., Ahaziah, one of the kings of Israel, fell through the upstairs floor of the palace into the lower room. And according to the biblical account, which is found in 2 Kings chapter 1, he injured himself and became ill, and he was looking for a speedy recovery. So he sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, an idol, idol god. These servants were to ask this foreign god whether the king would recover from his illness. The prophet Elijah met the messengers and asked them this question. Listen carefully. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? The prophet then said that the king would surely die. Ahaziah obviously did not take that prediction, so the king sent 50 messengers to Elijah to persuade him to change his mind. But the prophet did not change his mind, but called down fire from heaven, and it licked up the messengers. The king was still not convinced. So he sent another delegation of 50 who suffered the same fate. And when the third delegation came, Elijah went to visit the king, but the verdict did not change. Ahaziah the king would have to die, and Elijah again asked him this all-important question. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you have sent to Beelzebub? And that is a good question for us, is it not? Is it because we have no God that we must come to the God of the New Age, the God of pantheism? No, our God is still here. And it behooves us as men and women of the faith to make sure that we know the true God, that we spend time learning from this book how we can 
be more and more like his son Jesus Christ and one day my friend we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is but we will never be God God is in his heaven and we are on the earth God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to redeem us the new age movement is Satan's trick on the world that there can be a redemption without confession and repentance that there can be a nirvana without salvation and that we can know something beyond that which God has revealed to us and it is all a lie it is the old lie initiated in the heart of Satan introduced to Eve in the Garden of Eden and incorporated into the world system at Babylon